I was terrified signing that contract, seeing the hundreds of thousands of dollars I was agreeing to pay back over the next 30 years, but I'm so happy I did this. What's up guys, my name is Lily. If this is your first time to the channel, welcome. And this is where I document my real estate investing journey and bring you guys along with me. A little over a year ago, I made this video about house hacking my first investment property right out of college. And let me tell you, it has been a year. Between learning what the heck house hacking is, trying to analyze different deals to make sure I buy the right one, and trying to find tenants at the start of the lockdown, I have learned a lot this year and I wanna share some of those lessons with you. So before we dive in, do me a favor and change the color of the like button to let the YouTube algorithm know that you appreciate this free content, to let me know you appreciate it, and let's dive in. So what the heck is house hacking? And I did an ultimate guide, full breakdown of house hacking, and I'll link this video in the description for you. But the basic idea of house hacking is buying a house for yourself to live in and you rent out the extra space. You can do this with pretty much any type of property you want. You can get a single family house where you live in one of the bedrooms and rent out the other rooms, or if you want more privacy, more personal space, you can get a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, live in one unit and rent out the others. Again, that video in the description goes much more in depth, but if you want to do this, the biggest lesson that I've learned in my first year is to know your numbers. When you watch HGTV, it is so easy to get caught up in the emotional side of buying a house, thinking about the beautiful countertops or the window with the nice reading bench. It, it really can distract you from what I think is most important because you are making what is arguably the biggest purchase of your life, that is the numbers. The knowing your numbers part is in my opinion, the most important thing that I've learned this year. You'll need to really be locked in on numbers like how much are you pre-approved for? Um, what do you currently spend on your living expenses? What your future PITI payment might be? What you might make in rental income and what your potential expenses are. The amount that you're pre-approved for is a number that you'll get from the bank and they'll look at things like your income, your credit score, your job history, the amount of debt you have and they'll basically tell you based on all of that here's the amount that we're willing to lend you to buy this house typically first-time home buyers can use something called the fha loan program which lets you put down a much lower down payment 3.5 percent usually rather than going through a traditional loan getting a mortgage where you have to put down 20 percent now this is dependent on your individual personal situation with your finances. And when you put less down, you have to pay something called PMI, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's just take the example that you get pre-approved to buy a house for $200,000. And maybe it's more, maybe it's less, maybe it's just you on the loan, maybe you have a parent or a sibling co so you can afford more. Again, your personal situation, you really do need to call up a local bank. I recommend a local bank over like a big national bank because the local ones usually have better terms. But you call up a local bank, have them take you through their pre-approval process and they can tell you exactly how much they will be willing to loan you to buy a house. But for our example, let's say that we want to buy this $200,000 property right here. So we have this property for $195,000, basically $200,000, but the price isn't the only thing that we wanna look at. We also need to think about a lot of those other numbers that are involved. And for that, I have this house hacking deal calculator and I'll give it to you for completely free. You can just use the link in the description to get the download. It'll be emailed to you and it can work with either Excel or Google Sheets so everybody can use it. The only thing I ask is that you leave a like on this video um, in exchange for getting that calculator. But let's walk through kind of line by line how we use this and how we make sure that we have a full understanding of the numbers involved in this purchase. So only rule for you is only change the numbers that are in those gray boxes. So we think about our purchase price is going to be $195 thousand dollars so we throw that in there and then we want to think about what is our down payment going to be if you're using an fha loan you might put 3.5 percent down and what i have here for you is if you're using down payment assistance meaning some other person or entity or company is going to be paying that down payment for you then you can put the amount of assistance you're getting here so in my example when i purchased this property it was on an fha loan so the down payment was 3.5 percent but instead of having to pay that myself i used a first-time home buyer program in oklahoma and they paid the 3.5 percent for me so that's something that you might want to seriously seriously consider if you want to learn more about that you can check out this video right here all about how to use down payment assistance programs once we have that in there and again if you're not using a down payment assistance program you can just put zero percent and then you know nothing would happen but in this case let's assume that you do find a program they're pretty easy to find that will pay your down payment for you then you have to think about your closing costs closing costs are usually three to six percent 
of the purchase price. And this is something that when you're buying a property, you can ask the seller to help you with, but let's just imagine you pay about $4,000 in closing costs. So in our example here, you can see that you would be needing upfront to pay $7,800 to buy this house, right? Cause you're gonna be getting that $6,825 in down payment paid for you. If you weren't getting assistance, then you would have to pay that full amount but we'll assume that you are getting down payment assistance in this one. Then we have to think about what is the interest rate of the loan and what is the length of the loan? This is something that when you get pre-approved, the bank will tell you this information as well. So let's imagine for this $195,000 purchase, they also told us we can get a 4% interest rate. Right now, interest rates are even in the low 3%, so this might even be closer to like 3.5%. And, and I'll show you how that interest rate changes the numbers here in a moment. Um, and let's say it's a 30-year loan, right? So this information, purchase price, interest rate, and length of loan will be told to you when you're doing your pre-approval. Let's say that you could get a 3% interest rate. Do you see how much that lowers our debt service, which is basically the amount of money we need to pay back um, every month to satisfy that loan? So at 3%, it's $793 a month. At 4%, it's $898. So just 1% is over $100 a month less because of that interest. So let's just use an example of 3.5%. And this example rounds up to 4%, that's fine. But you can see right here that it is actually 3.5%. So that's our principal and our interest. So paying back the loan, they call that debt service. But we also have to think about the taxes and insurance. And this is where you hear the acronym PITI, stands for Principal Interest Taxes and Insurance. And it's kind of hard to know what your taxes and your insurance will be just kind of right off the bat, but I really like Redfin because if you scroll down on the same property, again, this is a four bedroom, 1.5 bathroom property. So we're imagining that you're gonna house hack this, live in one of the bedrooms and rent out the other three. Um, but when we scroll down, we have this payment calculator. So if we go in and we put that our interest rate is 3.5%, and that we are going to make a 3.5% down payment. I know those numbers are the same, but they mean different things, right? Our down payment is how much we're paying up front. Our interest rate is how much interest the bank is charging us to do the loan. So they can definitely be different numbers. Um, then it's gonna help us figure out what our homeowner's insurance and our property taxes are. So saying that homeowner's insurance is about $102, this is gonna change but this is something you can get an exact number on later. And the property taxes based on you know recent years are about 319. So 102 and 319. So yeah, 102 for the insurance and 319 for the property taxes, okay? And then the last thing we need to think about is our mortgage insurance. So if you put down less than 20%, a lot of loans are going to require you to pay PMI, which stands for private mortgage insurance. Um, and this is basically just a little bit extra insurance to help the lender feel comfortable that you're gonna pay back this loan. I mean, there is something to be said for charging people more because you're less confident that they're gonna pay it back. I mean, yeah, whatever. Anyway, that's a, that's a conversation for another video. But if you put down less than 20%, you usually have to pay PMI. It's gonna be about 1% a year. But again, on your pre-approval letter, they will tell you what the percentage of PMI you need to pay. So if it's 1%, you can put that in here. If it's 1.5%, you can put that in. And you can see it's going to raise the um, amount of mortgage insurance you have to pay every month. So just put in whatever the lender tells you right here in this gray box. In our example, it's 1% of the loan amount, so that would be $163 a month. And now we have our full PITI, our principal interest taxes and insurance. And that's telling us it's $1,428.49 a month that we will have to pay the bank in order to not foreclose on this property and have it taken from us. Okay, so then our next section is how much rent can we get from renting out the extra bedrooms in this property? So we have a four bedroom, 1.5 bathroom house. And one great thing I like to use, um, I like to look at properties on Redfin, but I really like this feature on Zillow where you can have this rent estimate. You could just Google Zillow rent estimator and you can put in the address and it will tell you what they think that the property would rent out for. Um, if you wanna see more of a, a comparison between Zillow and Redfin, check out this video right here. Um, but this is one thing I really like Zillow for. It's telling us that if we were to rent out this entire house, it would be about $14.50 a month that we could rent out this entire house for. Now, we're not renting out the entire house, right? We are renting out 
by the bedroom. And so you kind of have to do a little bit of guesstimation or, or thinking about what's realistic here. But if you can imagine that someone is willing to pay $1,450 a month for an entire house, how much would they be willing to pay for just one room? I would say $500, $600 each is probably gonna be pretty realistic. Um, you can also use something called rentometer.com, which will let you go by bedroom, but it's not free. There is a charge to use rentometer, but I'll put a link in the description below if you wanna use that and get a little bit more specific. For this example, I think $600 a room is probably pretty realistic. And remember, we're only renting out three bedrooms because we're gonna live in the fourth. So that means that we would be bringing in $1,800 a month in rent and paying out our PITI of $1,428 a month to the bank. But that's not it. Knowing your numbers means that we also have to account for these expenses down here. And this is how I typically like to do expenses. How much do you pay in utilities? This is why you have to know your current living expenses so you can get an idea. Is it $200 or $250? You're gonna be splitting it with your roommates. So just try to get an understanding of how much you're gonna pay there. Then you wanna set aside for different repairs that might pop up. Vacancy, if somebody moves out and the room is empty and you're not getting that $600 for a month or two, you wanna have been setting aside a little bit each month so that you can still keep up with your mortgage payments and your expenses. So that's why we set aside 50 for vacancy. If you're gonna cut your own lawn, so be it. But if you're not, set aside some money for it. Um, I don't know if where you live, trash is included in you know other utilities like water, but if it's not, set some aside for it, however much it costs. Then you have management. Now, when you're house hacking, it's really easy to manage your own property. You just kind of collect rent from your tenants, either by you know Venmo or Cash App or whatever you use. And when things need fixing, you call the plumber or you fix it yourself or whatever. But I recommend that even if you're gonna do that, set aside 10% or something so that you can pay yourself that for doing it or put it into savings or when you decide you wanna move out or you want to stop managing, you already know that the numbers work, even if you need to pay somebody to manage that rental for you. Management usually costs about 10%, so that's what I put there. And if there's other expenses, you can put them there. So what this is telling us is that on top of our PITI, we have an additional $605 a month in expenses. And so our total monthly expenses, we're gonna be needing $2,033.49. But what you'll find is in this fourth section, we talk about what is our return? What is our cash flow going to be? And we can see that in this situation, it's actually negative. We're gonna be paying $233.49 to make sure that we can pay the mortgage and cover all of the possible expenses on this property. But here's how I look at this. If I was paying $1,000 or $1,500 a month to live somewhere else, and then I buy this property, and now I only have to put in $233.49 a month, that is a huge amount of savings off of my previous living expenses. And so I'm not of the mindset that when you house hack, it 100% has to cash flow right off the bat because there is still some wiggle room in there of you know it's still less than what i was paying before i've drastically lowered my living expenses and i own a property that i'm building equity in and i'm getting tax savings and all these other good things so that's why i don't automatically look and say oh my gosh this is red i'm not going to buy this deal I could buy this deal and only put $233 a month towards my housing. I don't think there's rent anywhere in America that's less than $233, so that's probably a pretty good deal. But the next thing you wanna check is, what happens if you move out of this property? So if we want to rent out all four of the bedrooms for $600 each because we're moving out, then you can see that things drastically change. For one, we're probably not paying expenses um, utilities anymore because the people there will split them all between each other. So that probably goes to zero. And what we see now is that this property is now cash flowing us $556 a month. And based on what we put in, our ROI, so if we scroll back up, remember that we only put in $7,800 a month. And so when we look at the amount we're making per year, that's $6,678 divided by the amount we put in, that gives us our ROI, our return on investment, which would be an insane 85% for this deal. Now, obviously, I'm just guesstimating that we can make $600 a month um, per room, but that's the type of information that you really wanna nail down. We can also think about, okay, what if I didn't rent it out by the room, but I rented it out to one family, and we saw on the rental estimator that it was $14.50 a month. Well, then we would see that, well, actually, this wouldn't cash flow at that point because we'd be losing almost $300 a month. So 
this would only work if the rent was gonna be higher for one family or if we were able to rent out per month for let's say $600 a month. So these are the types of things that you really wanna dive into and I know it takes some time, but this is a really good um, calculator to practice with. When you're looking at properties, run those numbers, look at you know the estimate for the property taxes and the home insurance in, on Redfin, look at the Zillow estimate for rent um, and just kind of get familiar with the properties in your area and that will help you understand, is this actually a good deal? Because the last thing you wanna do is think that you're gonna be paying, let's say $1,400 a month, when in actuality you need $1,800 a month and now you've you know lost $400 a month out of your budget, you're stretching yourself thin, you're not able to you know really support that payment. You wanna know all of that information beforehand. So running your numbers like this is absolutely crucial and I'm so glad that the numbers I ran before I purchased the property were accurate to this past year and I've you know made the amount of money that I anticipated making because the opposite can be a really scary situation. Once you know your numbers and you buy a property and you're confident that everything's gonna work out the way you want, the next lesson I learned was to screen your tenants. It is so important to properly screen tenants for a lot of different reasons. I think probably the main reason is that when you're house hacking, you live either in the same house as your tenants or if you're in a multifamily property, you live in very close proximity to them. So you wanna make sure that that is going to be you know, a good, safe situation. If you list your property for rent on Zillow, Tenants can fill out the application, do a background check, do a credit check, they pay for it all through Zillow, which is a really nice feature. And you can feel confident that you know you have that background check, you have the credit score check, understanding of just a little bit who is the person that you're going to be allowing to live with you. I definitely recommend that you meet your tenants in person if possible, and if you can do it safely to get a feeling of who you're gonna be living with. You should also call their references that they provide on the rental application, so you can get other people's opinion, you can talk to their last landlord, just make sure, okay, did they pay their rent on time? Did they completely trash the place when they left? Those types of things. But you're also going to wanna to make sure that you research your state's fair housing laws because as the owner of the house who's renting portions of it out, that is definitely your responsibility. And different states have different laws, but there are things you cannot discriminate against like sexual orientation or race or gender, familial status or age. These are all really important things. So if you put in your listing, um, no kids allowed, that could be seen as you discriminating against someone based on their familial status. Or if you put looking for, you know, a 20 year old female, you know, because you want to live with someone who's similar in age to you, that could be seen as discriminating against age and gender. So there are a lot of things that you just want to make sure you understand because as the homeowner, it is your responsibility to do things in a correct and legal way. So researching your state laws is going to be crucial when you're screening tenants. The final thing I learned this year is don't rush. Especially right now, the housing market is on fire. Um, prices are skyrocketing. I know when properties come on the market, it can be literally minutes or hours before they're already gone and under contract. And this can kind of create this sense of urgency, like I need to find a property, I need to find a property. And let me tell you, that can be a big mistake. The day before I found this house, like literally the day before, I had made an offer on another property and someone beat me out and the seller rejected my offer. And I was literally really, really bummed. Like I was out to dinner with my parents pre-lockdown, but I was out to dinner with my parents and I was so sad. And I was sitting there and I was um, scrolling through Zillow on my phone and I saw that this property had just popped on the market like literal minutes earlier. So I text the owner that night, I met her here the next morning and literally as we were walking through, I was like, I want it, I will pay you this amount. We shook on it and a few hours later we signed the contract. And the reason that I felt so confident was because I had been looking for so long. I had been running my numbers. I knew exactly how much rent I could get. I knew exactly how much I was pre-approved for. All of that was laid in stone. I took my time and I was actually so glad that I didn't get the property the day before because it was not as nice at all. Um, and so it was good that, you know, I just waited for the right one to come along and I just, you know, try to have that faith and believe that the right one would come for me and I would know when I saw it. And I did, I felt really confident when I found this property. So try not to rush, try not to get caught up in just, you know, properties are going really fast. I know it's really tough. I just missed out on a deal that would have been a home run. You can check out this video right here if you wanna see that. Um, but try not to rush, try to really understand what you're doing and if it's taking a little bit longer, just look at that as you're gaining more information that's gonna help you make a better decision in the future. 
What are the questions you guys have for me about being a homeowner, being a young homeowner? Leave those questions in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. I'm so glad that I did this. If you wanna see more about my house hacking journey this past year, I will link this playlist in the description for you. Until next time, don't forget to change the color of that like button and thanks for watching.